Hello everyone. The topic for this week is understanding balance sheet. We will learn about the elements of balance sheet and the different format as well as the accounting issues related to current and non-current assets and liabilities as well as the different measurement basis for assets and liabilities. Finally, we will cover balance sheet analysis using common size analysis as well as liquidity and solvency ratios. Balance sheet is also known as the statement of financial position or the statement of financial condition. The IFRS uses the term the statement of financial position in International Accounting Standard 1 which is the presentation of financial statements. The US GAAP on the other hand uses both the terms interchangeably. We know the five elements of financial statements that is assets, liabilities, owner's equity, revenues and expenses. We know that revenues and expenses are treated in the income statement. However, assets, liabilities and owner's equity they are shown in the balance sheet and assets are equal to liabilities plus owner's equity. This is what we learned in our discussion on the accounting mechanics in chapter 2. The balance sheet shows what an entity owns are controls which means the assets of the business, what it owes that is the liabilities and what the owner's claims are at a specific point in time. This is represented by the accounting equation that we have here. Assets of the entity represents the resources it controls as a result of the past events and from assets or resources that it controls it expects to receive future economic benefit which may be spread over one or more accounting periods. If an asset is expected to provide economic benefit over a period of less than one year it is classified as current asset. If its economic benefit will be received over more than one year period, it is classified as non-current asset. Liabilities represent an entity's obligation that arise from past events which will require settlement in the future resulting in the outflow of economic benefit from the entity. If a liability is due to be paid in less than one year period, it is classified as current liability on the balance sheet. If a liability has a maturity that extends beyond one year period, it is classified as non-current liability. Equity represents the owner's residual interest or residual claim on the company's assets after deducting liabilities. It is also known as the net book value of assets. For all financial items, an item can only be recognized in the financial statement if it is probable that any future economic benefit associated with the item will flow to or from the entity and if the item has a cost or value that can be measured with reliability. Though the balance sheet provides important information about the company's financial position, including its assets, liabilities and equity, it must be noted that the balance sheet reports accounting values for all these items on the financial position of the business. Some assets and liabilities on the balance sheet are measured based on historical costs, while other assets and liabilities are measured based on a current value. The measurement basis may have a significant effect on the amount reported. Therefore, the balance sheet value of equity should not be considered as a measure of either the market or intrinsic value of a company's equity for this reason. In addition, even the item measures at current value reflect the value that was current at the end of the reporting period. The financial statements are made available in the annual report to the journal public and other users of financial statements after some time of the reporting period. As a result, the current values of assets and liabilities reported in the balance sheet may not be reflecting the current values at the time the reports are made available. Also note that the value of a company is a function of many factors including the future cash flows expected to be generated by the company as well as the current market conditions. Important aspects of a company's ability to generate future cash flows for example 
its reputation and management skills are not included in its balance sheet. For all these reasons, the equity value reported in the balance sheet should never be equated to the intrinsic value or market value of the equity of the company. Here we have the asset side of the balance sheet of Colgate Formolive Company for the year ended 31st December 2011. Colgate Formolive is a manufacturer and we can see that it shows the typical asset accounts for a manufacturer here. It includes cash, inventories, property, plant and equipment, goodwills and other intangible assets. However, you must note that the composition of the assets will vary from one industry to another and from one company to another. This is reflecting the business risk that the company is exposed to. The industry in which the company operates determines the type of assets and the amount invested in each for a company. We know that any factor that has the ability to adversely affect any item on the income statement from sales still operating income is a source of business risk. The most important of these factors such as the level of competition in the industry, the sales volume, the sales price of products, the cost of inputs and resourcing of raw materials etc as well as the amount spent on advertising, marketing and other sales campaign activities are directly related to the industry. The asset structure of firms therefore vary from one industry to another to account for these factors. Here we have the liabilities of Colgate for Molive as on 31st December 2011. The liabilities generally are the same for most of the companies across different industries however there may be variations specific to industry or companies. Banks and other financial institutions for example will have significant amount of liabilities relative to a manufacturing company such as Colgate for Molive. Here we have the total shareholders equity of Colgate for Molive company reported as on 31st December 2011 in the balance sheet. The total shareholders equity include items such as common stock issued, additional paid in capital, retained earnings and accumulated other comprehensive income. This has then been adjusted for unearned compensation as well as non-controlling interest. The total shareholders equity as on 31st December 2011 is 2,541 million. Liquidity refers to the ability to convert an asset into cash or for a liability how early it is due. There are two elements of liquidity, speed at which an asset can be converted into cash and the amount realized on conversion. For example, an illiquid asset such as property can be quickly converted into cash if it is offered for a sale at a significantly lower price compared to fair value. This will not be a good example of liquidity. In other words, liquidity refers to the nearness to cash of an asset or a liability. Generally, liquidity is used to refer to the ability of a company to be able to pay its short-term obligations. Generally, financial statements prepared in accordance with IFRS present the balance sheet information in reverse order of liquidity compared with US GAAP. For example, using IFRS, assets are presented starting with non-current assets followed by current assets and equity is presented first followed by non-current liabilities and then current liability. However, note that IFRS does not prescribe the reverse ordering. The International Accounting Standard 1 presentation of financial statement states that this standard does not prescribe the order or format in which an entity presents items. Here we have the portion of the balance sheet of Henkel company that represents its assets in the reverse liquidity order starting with intangible assets that are considered the most illiquid asset followed by property, plant and equipment and then we see that cash and cash equivalents as well as assets held for sale are reported here. Here we have another example of a reverse order liquidity balance sheet. This is from L'Oreal's balance sheet. The asset side here shows that goodwill is reported first as a non-current assets followed by other intangible assets and then plant and equipment. 
and lastly we see that it shows cash and cash equivalents which are the most liquid it is important for the balance sheet to distinguish between current and non-current assets and current and non-current liabilities and present them separately separate presentation of current and non-current assets and liabilities enable the analyst to examine the company's liquidity position at the end of the financial period both the IFRS and the US GAAP require that the balance sheet should distinguish between current and non-current assets and between current and non-current liabilities and therefore present these separately. Such balance sheets are generally referred to as classified balance sheet. However, an exception to this requirement under the IFRS is that the current and non-current classifications are not required if a liquidity-based presentation provide reliable and more relevant information. In such a case, an entity shall present all assets and liabilities in the order of liquidity. Here we have the assets from the balance sheet of Barclays Bank as on 31st December 2011. Cash and balances at central banks are the most liquid assets that are followed by other assets which decrease in liquidity as we move downward. So here we see Retirement benefit assets are the most illiquid assets. Now we learn about current and non-current assets and liabilities. Current assets are those that are held primarily for the purpose of trading or these are expected to be sold, used or otherwise realized in cash within one year or one operating cycle of the business, whichever is greater. Current assets are generally maintained for operating purposes and these assets include in addition to cash items such as convertible into cash for example trade receivables used up for example office supplies and prepaid expenses are sold for example inventory in the current period. Current assets provide information about the operating activities and the operating capability of the entity. For example, trade receivables or account receivable indicate that a company provides credit to its customers. Operating cycle is the average amount of time that elapses between acquiring inventory and collecting the cash from the sales to customers. For a manufacturer, this is the average amount of time between acquiring raw materials and converting these into cash from a sale. Companies that might be expected to have operating cycles longer than one year include those operating in the tobacco, distillery and lumber industries. Even though these types of companies often hold inventories longer than one year, the inventory is classified as a current asset because it is expected to be sold within an operating cycle. Non-current assets, also known as long-lived assets or long-term assets, are those that are not classified as current assets. Non-current assets represent the infrastructure from which the entity operates and are not consumed or sold in the current period. Investment in such assets are made from a strategic or longer term perspective. Similarly, liabilities expected to be settled within one year or within one operating cycle of the business, whichever is greater, after the reporting period are classified as current liabilities. The specific criteria for classification of a liability as a current liability include the following. Number one, it is expected to be settled in the entity's normal operating cycle. Number two, it is held primarily for the purpose of being traded. Number three, it is due to be settled within one year after the balance sheet date. And number four, the entity does not have an unconditional right to defer settlement of the liability for at least one year after the balance sheet date. Also note that the IFRS specify that some current liabilities, for example, accounts payable or trade payables and some accruals for employee and other operating costs are part of the working capital used in the entity's normal operating cycle. Such operating items are classified as current liabilities even if they will be settled more than one year after the balance sheet date. When an entity's normal operating cycle is not clearly identifiable, its duration is assumed to be one year. Non-current liabilities or long-term liabilities are those liabilities that have not been classified as current liabilities. 
These include long-term debt, loan from bank, bonds issued, etc. Working capital is the excess of current assets over current liabilities. That is, current assets minus current liabilities is equal to working capital, generally known as net working capital. The level of working capital tells analysts something about the ability of an entity to meet its liabilities as they fall due. Although adequate working capital is essential, working capital should not be too large because funds may be tied up that could be used more productively elsewhere. That is why inventory management, cash management and receivable management are considered so important. Accounting standards require that reporting entities report certain specific line items if they are material on the face of the balance sheet. Among the current assets, the required line items include cash and cash equivalents, trade and other receivables, inventories and financial assets that have short-term maturities. Companies present other line items as needed consistent with the requirements to separately present each material class of similar items. Cash and cash equivalents are financial assets and financial assets in journal are measured and reported at their amortized cost or fair values in the financial statements. Amortized cost is the historic cost that is initially recognized cost of the asset adjusted for any amortization and impairment. Under the IFRS, fair value is the amount at which an asset can be exchanged or a liability can be settled in an arm's length transaction between knowledgeable and willing parties. Under the US GAAP, the definition is similar but it is based on an exit price, the price received to sell an asset or paid to transfer a liability rather than an entry price. For cash and cash equivalents, amortized cost and fair value are likely to be immaterially different. That is, amortized cost and fair value of cash and cash equivalents will generally be the same. Examples of cash and cash equivalents are demand deposits with bank, that is money kept in checking accounts, and highly liquid investments such as the US Treasury bills, commercial paper and money market deposits with original maturities of less than three months. Cash and cash equivalents also exclude amounts that are restricted for use for at least 12 months. For all the companies, the statement of cash flow presents information about the changes in cash over a period of time. That is, the cash flow statement is basically the statement that accounts for the changes in the opening balance and closing balance of cash for a company. Trade receivables are also known as accounts receivable and these are another type of financial asset. These are amounts owed to a company by its customers for goods and services that have already been delivered. They are typically reported at the net realizable value which is an approximation of the fair value based on its estimates of collectability. Several aspects of account receivables are usually relevant to an analyst. First, an increase in the level of accounts receivable relative to sales, that is a decline in the receivable turnover ratio, which we will discuss later, is significant. An increase in the accounts receivable relative to sales may be indicating that the company is not able to collect money from its customer in time. Second, allowances for doubtful accounts reflect the company's estimate of the money that will ultimately be not collected from customers. Amounts not collected, that is bad debt expenses, as well as the balance of the allowance for doubtful accounts, reduce the gross receivable that is reported in the balance sheet at net realizable value, that is net receivables. You may remember this from your accounting course that the allowance for doubtful debt is basically a contra asset account that reduces the accounts receivable. Another important aspect is the age of an account receivable balance and it refers to the length of time the receivable has been outstanding that is not collected from the customer. Finally, concentration of credit risk is another important aspect of accounts receivable. 
A company's credit risk is more limited when it has a large number of customers diversified across various industries and countries. Compared to only one or few customers accounting for the large percentage of their revenue or receivables. Here in this figure we illustrate the cost flow of inventory for a company that purchases inventory items for resale for example a wholesaler or a retailer. It shows that the measurement basis of inventory on the balance sheet is directly related to the measurement of cost of goods sold on the income statement and we discussed this last week when we covered income statement and the reporting of cost of goods sold and inventory. The amount of ending inventory reported in the balance sheet depends on the cost flow assumption used that is the use of FIFO, LIFO, weighted average cost method or the specific identification method. Goods purchased are added to the beginning inventory that gives us the goods available for sale which is then distributed between ending inventory and cost of goods sold depending on whether the LIFO method is used, the FIFO or the weighted average cost method or the specific identification method is used. The cost of goods sold is then close to the income statement while the ending inventory is reported in the balance sheet and the amount of cost of goods sold and the amount of inventory reported as ending inventory depend on the cost flow assumption. One area where differences between IFRS and US GAAP exist is the inventory measurement. Under US GAAP, the lower of cost or market method is used while the IFRS uses the lower of cost or the net realizable value. Inventory cost includes all cost of purchase, cost of conversion and other costs that are incurred in bringing the inventories to their present location and condition. The net realizable value is the estimated selling price less the estimated cost of completion and cost necessary to make the sale of the inventory. Under the US GAAP, the market value is defined as the current replacement cost but with the upper and lower limits, it cannot exceed the net realizable value and it cannot be lower than the net realizable value less a normal profit margin. If the net realizable value under the IFRS or market value under US GAAP of a company's inventory falls below its carrying amount, the company must write down the value of the inventory. The loss in value is reflected in the income statement. Under the IFRS, if inventory that was written down in a previous period subsequently increases in value, the amount of the original write down is reversed. Subsequent reversal of an inventory write down is not permitted under the US GAAP. Inventory sold is reported as cost of goods sold in the income statement as an expense. Accounting standards allow the use of different valuation methods for determining the amounts that are incurred in cost of goods sold on the income statement and therefore the amounts that are reported in inventory on the balance sheet. Inventory valuation methods are referred to as cost formulas under IFRS and the cost flow assumption under US GAAP. IFRS allows only the first in first out method, the weighted average cost method and the specific identification method. However, the US GAAP also allow the use of LIFO method which is not permitted under IFRS.